I've been playing outdoors since I was a kid. Standing by the front door at around two years old, hollering, side, 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 trying to get my mom to let me go play outside. Now, after 30 plus years working in the outdoor business, I'm dropping insider conversations every week with the brand leaders, guides, marketers, CEOs, and others to make the outdoor industry a trillion dollar juggernaut that drives product innovation, revenue, and public policy for everything outdoors. I'm Rick Says. Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Outdoor Biz Podcast in episode 431. This week I'm talking with Rachel Gross, an environmental and cultural historian of the modern U.S. and an assistant professor of history at the University of Colorado, Denver. Among many accolades and experiences, Rachel was a Carson Fellow at the Rachel Carson Center in Munich, and for her doctoral research, wrote about the history of outdoor clothing and gear in the U.S. from the Civil War to the present. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, glad to, glad we're, we're here and glad you're participating. This is going to be a fun conversation. I have two degrees in outdoor recreation myself, so I always love to talk the educational side of the of the equation. It's going to be, it's, it's fun stuff. Yeah, I definitely bring the academic perspective, so yeah, that's, that's right. what we'll do. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start off with your first outdoor adventure. What was that? Well, I came from a family that was not very outdoorsy, but nonetheless, my parents took me camping when I was a kid, and we all stumbled our way through figuring it out together. <laughs> so in many ways, the type of research I do now on the history of the outdoor industry is because of those very early family camping trips to Sequoia and other national parks in California, where I started to learn that kind of the gear that you had mattered somewhat, but also that I really liked it, mm. you know, far beyond what was necessary. I loved being out in the woods. Mm -hmm. I love climbing mountains and I loved all the stuff that went with it. And, and that's part of what the first adventure was for me. Very cool. Camping. That's, that was mine as well. Do you get out and camping a lot now? Hike, bike, climb, any of that stuff? I do. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm so lucky to have landed a job in Colorado where I get to pursue a lot of the things that were just a, a real dream when I was in graduate school in Wisconsin for, for nearly a decade. So yeah, these days, I continue to camp and backpack, but I've also picked up mountain biking, which is something new mm. uh, for me in the last few years. And, and I was not a skier growing up, but I, I ski now. So, so adding plenty of things to the list as Colorado residents inspire me to do more. There's lots to do there. I used to live in Colorado. It's yeah. great. Yeah, I love it there. Where did you go to school in Wisconsin? In Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Okay, nice. Yeah. And so your education, your education and work across the environment and outdoors, you Sorry, let me start that over again. <clears throat> Your education and work is, a, is across the environment, outdoors and humanities. Was that intentional? Did you go in planning that? Oh, it, it, it very much was, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I was an undergraduate in, at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, I thought I wanted to spend my time there basically climbing mountains, going to Mount Rainier, being out in the woods. But it turned out I was far more interested, that which I hadn't expected, in in writing about the people who did those kinds of things. Oh, so in other words, I wanted to be like kind of connected to the outdoors, but a lot of my research from that very early time was about people who pursued outdoor activities, who worked to protect wilderness and other natural areas, and who kind of helped to create the aesthetic of outdoor recreation that that I now know and love very well. Right. And so in that sense, yeah, when I went on to more formal study in graduate school in the years that followed, I knew that aligning kind of this like formal academic program with stuff that I was really passionate about personally was mm -hmm. the only way to get through it and actually make it out the other end. And so in that sense, yes, I, I did plan to pursue a project that would allow me to travel to beautiful gateway cities close to national parks um, nice. or or places where people really cared about outdoor recreation and wild places. And so I, did, I got to travel to archives and libraries for the, for the purpose of research for this book. And I got to go to beautiful places to do it. And so in that sense, yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be able to plan a project that allowed me to keep kind of in the same world that I loved so much while still doing something academic with it. Very cool. That's great. It's, it's good when all those plans come together, right? Yeah. <laughs> So you were a Carson Fellow at the Rachel Carson Center. That must have been quite an honor. How'd that come about? Yeah. So the Rachel Carson Center, though it's named after an American, is located in Munich, Germany, and it brings mm. together scholars from all over the world who focus on histories of the environment in some kind of way or, or environmental topics. And so they bring in people who, they don't have to be historians of Germany, luckily, because I am not, <laughs> but I got to work on my 
on turning my dissertation project into a book manuscript while I was there. And so the the benefit is not just you get to live in a beautiful place, but also that I got to kind of get feedback from people, you know, with really wide ranging expertise who don't write about the United States at all, but who think about forest in Eastern Europe or agriculture in Northern China. And they're the ones who helped me to think about how do I make this relevant to a broader audience? And, you know, how do you make this interesting if people aren't necessarily in love with the outdoor brands that I know and love from childhood, right? So mm -hmm. how, how do you can tell stories that are of interest to more people? So so that's that's part of what was so great about my time at the Rachel Carson Center. And Munich is a great place to be for outdoor folks. I mean, there's just a rich history of outdoor activity there in Germany and some great brands. I bet that was fun too. It was, yeah. I, I went to, there's a, similar to the US, a, a really big outdoor store with lots of experiences <laughs> built into the, you know, like yeah. there's a pond in the middle where you can test things out. There's a, a wind and rain chamber where you can try on jackets and an outdoor kind of club resources within the store itself. So I went to that because that's exactly the kind of thing I love to see. Yeah, I've been there many times. We sold to those guys. So we'd go over there for yeah. the yeah. European sales meetings. It was super fun, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. So for your doctoral research, you wrote about the history of outdoor clothing and gear in the U.S. from the Civil War to present. I'll, mm -hmm. bet, that, I'll bet that was pretty interesting. What surprised you most about their gear, their old gear? Yeah, I mean, so the the, the thing that I was expecting to find is that there was some kind of golden age in the American outdoor past when mm. people weren't so gear obsessed, where they weren't all about consumer goods and having the latest and best to look the part, right. where there was a time when that didn't matter. What I was surprised to find is that that is not true, right? From mm. the very beginning of outdoor recreation in the late 19th century, Americans have been you know, very concerned, rightfully so, with having functional clothing and equipment so that they don't freeze to death, for instance, so that they right, can sleep right. the night through. Stay but dry. also, yeah. they were just as concerned with if they looked the part of an outdoors person <laughs> of the time period. So in other words, my assumption that, oh, like there is a time before rampant consumerism is not quite accurate. Instead, what I found is that outdoor recreation itself developed in tandem with an industry and with consumer goods. And so... um it doesn't make sense to be nostalgic. You know, I was surprised to find about some theoretical idealistic past where we were kind of beyond that and above it. Um, yep. In fact, we should be looking at how consumerism has been a part of the outdoor experience since the very beginning. That's interesting because I would have thought they wouldn't have been so gear clothing focused because there wasn't that much. I thought that what drove that was the just the ubiquity of all the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I actually think it went the other way around. So yes, there was not a lot of options for outdoor adventures um, in the 1870s or 1890s. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, many took their cues from kind of rugged outdoor models like Teddy Roosevelt, mm -hmm. who in his Western travels and adventures sought to get a buckskin suit made by a Native, a Native American woman in part because he saw that as an emblem of what it means to be an authentic outdoors person in the West. Hmm. So Teddy Roosevelt himself, who became kind of a model for other people who were reading his works or looking at photographs of him, because there are right. plenty, right. was really concerned with, I want to look the part. I want to make sure I seem like an authentic Western hunter. Wow. And so he sought out a buckskin suit. And so many other people followed in his footsteps, not because they knew how to shoot deer and tan the hides and then make their own buckskin suits, but rather right. because they wanted to look like they could have, right? The mm -hmm. idea that they mm -hmm. might have done that was really important. And so they too sought out the expertise of Native American women who had been doing this kind of work for, for many, many years. Many years, um, yeah. And then, and then, you know, they read in the guidebooks, like, here's the right way to not look like a greenhorn or a, <laughs> a newbie, right, in the field. Yeah. And so, and so even in the 18... 1880s or 1890s, outdoors people were kind of trying to, were worried about what if they think I'm an, a beginner? What if they look at my buckskin suit and don't know that I really know what I'm doing? Right, um, and so right. that kind of attitude where the linking of the clothes that we wear, the products that we buy with expertise and belonging is a consistent thread throughout this history. That's wild. So we've always wanted to look the part from the very beginning rather than, <laughs> that's weird. That's, that's just, that's right. Yeah. I don't get that. What about, did you do any, find out anything about their, uh, their 
equipment, hard goods like stoves and tents and things? What was that like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of resistance in the very early guidebooks of this time period to buying any kind of stuff, right? The, Mm. the, The woodcraft ethic of the late 19th century suggested that any real outdoorsman and they were mostly men should be able to build whatever he needed in order to survive Mm -hmm. from the woods itself. In other words, you wouldn't buy a stove. You would make your fire out in the woods. You wouldn't buy a comfortable bed or mattress and bring it with you from a store. You would cut down branches and kind of make your, your little nest in, in the pine needles, for Mm -hmm. instance. And so there was this attitude that, um, according to the Woodcraft ethic, like you shouldn't be buying any equipment because that's going to mark you as somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. And only, mm. again, newcomers would rely on this kind of stuff rather than being able to create it themselves. And but the very fact that this myth was repeated so often suggests that a lot of people were buying and were quite uncomfortable with that fact, but, but they did it nonetheless because they didn't necessarily know how to build everything that they needed. Right, right. And was it, was it, was the build your own come from the Native American ethic where they did it. I mean, they just lived off the land. They did everything that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that where some of that came from, do you think? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of the early white God guidebook authors try to claim a close relationship with either kind of specific Native Americans or kind of a composite figure of a Native American man or, or specifically a guide because it is their way of saying like, look, we're getting our information from the best place, which is people who really know what they're doing. And that is the people who've lived on this land for generations. And so in that sense, though, I focus a lot more on the white guidebook authors and the, on what they're producing, because that's what gets disseminated in right. um, publications across the country. You can see references to kind of, white settlers' relationships to the Native American past. In other words, the same kind of stories that we see repeated when it comes to Native peoples being removed from national parks in the early 20th century, there's a similar kind of expectation among these guidebook authors. They're saying both, it's important to recognize this past because it's going to give us our sense of belonging, expertise, and authenticity, and also we are now the natural inheritors of this place and we're the ones who belong in the future. It's interesting. I just am working my way through that documentary, The West. It's on, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's on Amazon Prime. It's just fascinating how all that stuff happened and how those people went and lived off the land back in the day. You know, I mean, they they weren't camping, so to speak, but they were camping, so to speak, because that's what right. they had to, right, right. that's what homesteading was in those days. It's pretty mm-hmm. interesting. Um, have you done any projects on the manufacturing, wholesale, or retail side of the outdoor industry? Yes, I have. Yeah. The the book that I wrote, which is built off of the dissertation we were just talking about, looks at the outdoor industry from a number of different angles. It focuses on consumers who buy stuff and kind of what meanings they attach to it. But it also looks really carefully at the people who worked in the industry from shopkeepers, retailers, store owners, mm-hmm. to people who work on the manufacturing side, even you know in the chemical industry, producing the ingredients that eventually go into outdoor gear. Wow. And I think that's important for a couple of reasons. But one is that it's really hard to to kind of get a sense of the industry by just focusing on people who buy or people who sell, right? right I, yeah. I think it's, it's useful to have a balance between those two and to see kind of how the messages that companies think that they're sending actually land with consumers. Right. And to do that, right, to pay attention to hear, hear the messages on the ground about what it means to buy this pair of socks, you also have to look at kind of where did the materials come from, how are they sold, who are they accessible to, and, and that's that means paying attention to not just consumers but also corporate records to get a sense of where the stuff comes from. So have you been to Asia to some of those factories? I haven't, no. The the project is U.S.-based only because I had to cut it off at some point, and yeah. it's endlessly rich. But I would love to read more about that history because I, I yeah. you know, talked to a number of people who are experts in the contemporary realm when it comes to outdoor gear manufacturing post-1970 when a lot of the, that shifted yeah. offshore. Yeah. And also, I don't think there has been comprehensive work done on the history. And so I'm like, I'm just crossing my fingers that after people read this book in the scholarly realm, that they'll say like, oh, there are more stories to be told here. I haven't captured everything, right? That would be the ideal outcome because then we all get to learn more about how that works. Oh, there totally are. I mean, I you know, I'm lucky to have started in the outdoor biz way back and I think it was Eagle Creek was the brand I was working with where we first met the folks from Punk Hook, PK, mm. so to speak, right? Pa- great pack makers. They make most of the pa- a lot of the packs. 
and they were manufacturing in Mexico. And so we went, we were down in Mexico. I figure what we were doing down there, but we got to meet the guys down there and tour the factories. And then having, having gone onto the product side of the business later with other brands, getting to go over there and see punk cook over in Vietnam was mm-hmm. fascinating. So all those, I'm, there's a lot of stories there. I mean, I can't, mm-hmm. can't imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That'd be great. So, and your book, your book is out now, right? Shopping all the way to the woods. And yeah, it, the release date is March 26th, 24th. I didn't actually, <laughs> I think it's one of those two. Oh, okay, um, okay. So yeah, so, I'm looking forward to getting on shelves. Coming out soon, yeah. Yeah. Can you give us a little teaser about it? Yeah, this book is about how no escape to nature is complete without going shopping first. In other words, <laughs> it examines the paradox at the heart of the American outdoor experience, which is that for many aspiring outdoors people, buying, acquiring all the goods for camping, backpacking, or other outdoor activities is a central part of the outdoor experience, even though we might think getting back to nature is somehow apart from all of that. It's somehow anti-commercial and escape from Mm -hmm. the modern world. It very much is not. And so it looks at 150-year history of the outdoor industry from the earliest days before there was a comprehensive set of companies to the um, influence of the U.S. military on camping um, and other outdoor clothing and equipment to the boom years of the 1970s and going forward. And it examines what kinds of ideas people attach to the stuff that they buy. So Mm -hmm. just like any other product that we might, you know, go out and buy from cooking equipment to the gardening tools that we might use, Americans don't just mindlessly acquire goods. They have deep emotional connections to the stuff that they purchase because they care a lot about it working and they also care about what it says about who they are as people. And so this Mm -hmm. book is an examination of the history of the industry and of the American outdoor identity that the industry helped to create. Man, that's going to be interesting. I can't wait to get my hands on that. Hey, do you write a lot? No, I mean a lot. It feels like I write a ton. From podcast show notes, questions for guests, to social posts, I'm always trying to create compelling content, but also write properly. Proper spelling, grammar, sentence structure. I want it to sound good and also be correct. And I can hear Mrs. Muir from my high school English class in my ear as she reviews my paper and kindly points out all the mistakes I made. Particularly mixing up the I and the E. I still do that today. If you write as much as I do, it's nice to have a little backup with spelling and grammar, and I use Grammarly. Grammarly is a cloud-based typing assistant. It reviews spelling, punctuation, clarity, engagement, delivery mistakes, detects plagiarism, and suggests replacements for the identified errors. It also allows users to customize their style, tone, and context-specific language. Their instant grammar checker corrects all grammar errors and enhances your writing. To try it out, go to ricksays.com slash grammar check and get signed up today. You can thank me later. That's ricksays.com slash grammar check. Let's get back to the show. It is interesting how, I don't know if it's outdoors is, it's unique to the outdoors, but I don't know of any other activities. Like, imagine if you had to go buy new pots and pans every time you made dinner. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that that wouldn't work. I mean, that's something you do every day, but... Yeah, I mean, the reason I actually I make that parallel is because it's it's for, you know, a whole different set of consumers, people who care about yeah. fancy cooking gadgets, which I also do because I love cooking. And and I have a garlic press that I carefully researched and I, I'm, you know, kind of looked at what are the experts mm-hmm. saying mm-hmm. about it and what are the tests and the reviews say about it. And I also am happy to have that when guests come over, say like, oh, you have that one, you know, and we right, talk all right. about how it works and all that. And so in that sense, like becoming a kind of a cooking cognoscenti, a person who knows what they're doing and reads the right literature and talks to the right experts or at least learns from them is a hallmark of American consumerism, right? It's it's about participating and not just saying, I'm going to crush some garlic today for my food, but also I'm going to do it in a certain way that says something about all the things that I know. And And with with a certain tool, the latest, greatest tool, the best tool, whatever, the brand name tool, whatever. Exactly. And so in that sense, I think buying gear isn't so different. Like if you want to crush garlic, you need something, a knife or, you know, a garlic press. And if you, and if you want to sleep outdoors, you're going to need something to keep you warm. There are so many different options for how to do that that can be the right way. And I'm not in the book suggesting here's the right pack to have or this Mm -hmm. is the correct packing list that you're going to need. Instead, what I examine is the fact that so many people believe there is one right way, right? Mm -hmm. That there is a set of products that if they just figured it out would kind of associate them with 
the expertise that they're seeking out. And so that's really what I'm interested in. It's not finding out the best stuff, but rather where people's ideas about this is the right way to do the outdoors and that's the wrong way. And I don't want to be that kind of person, that kind of kind of dynamic of navigating who's in and who's out, what's good and comfortable and what's doesn't work and should be banned. All of those things are questions, I think, that help us understand the American outdoor identity. Yeah, where's that psychology come from? Because a lot of us product guys would like to know that, right? Because mm-hmm, that'll help right. that help the product design side of the world. Yeah, that's interesting. So any learnings that you've come away about the initiative to drive sustainability, both in manufacturing as well as the day-to-day operations in the outdoor industry? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one important one from the historical perspective is that the drive for sustainability is not something new in the 21st century. Right. In fact, I was really inspired by a lot of the outdoor company owners and workers from the late 60s and early 1970s who kind of looked around at the products they were selling made out of petrochemicals and the nature they were trying to protect and said, hey, these goods are at odds with the kind of values we hope to represent. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that era, the 1970s, is really interesting because it represented a turning point where outdoor companies like so many others could have made really different and interesting choices about how to pursue kind of a sustainable form of consumerism, like selling less, selling materials that would be more in line with the values that they hope to represent, and thinking about the shopping experience from kind of how you pack the goods to mail them or, you know, what bags you send customers home with, that they could could change all of those things and change the way they did business. That didn't, for the most part, happen, right? There were really interesting conversations about this, and a number of companies in the outdoor world started to make small changes. So some good examples from the book are Sierra Designs or Sierra Design or REI. Mm -hmm. REI started launching trash pickups led by both employees and by customers themselves who wanted to go and clean up wilderness areas in Washington State, for instance. Sierra Design had an interesting run of catalogs where they said, look, we're not going to send models to far-flung locations. We're going to do the photography for what we're trying to sell in our own backyard because Mm -hmm. why be so wasteful as to do that when we can just as easily do the work here and still get the same outcome? I think those are really great moves that were way ahead of their time, and the outdoor industry has long been a leader in this area. And so looking at those kinds of decisions and historical perspective shows that the outdoor industry has, in fact, been kind of leading a lot of these conversations in part because they're selling to people who also care about them and they're led by run by people who care about environmental values as well. Yeah. I think that the kind of ultimate lesson though coming out of this research is except if you're actually climbing a mountain, <laughs> which which I like hiking, but I'm not doing that too often. <laughs> um, so I'm a good example of the kind of more moderate outdoors person who doesn't need any kind of extreme equipment. Mm-hmm. A lot of the things that I love aren't necessary. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. figuring out how to align this notion that we don't need more stuff, that we don't necessarily need to buy everything, that what I have that's not specialized is probably good enough for the kinds of activities that I'm doing right. is something that the industry really hasn't confronted in a big way yet. Right. So mm-hmm, we've made mm-hmm. important, and I wouldn't even call them small changes, right. Using organic cotton yeah, or, big changes. Le- you know, is, is, is a phenomenal and important shift mm-hmm. in how t-shirts that people wear <laughs> are produced. Right, and yet right. that doesn't, do, that's not the same answer as saying, maybe we don't need any more of these kinds of t-shirts, or maybe people don't need to buy them as often as they do. And that's something, it would be hard to come from an industry, right? Because Mm -hmm. industries have bottom lines. But I do think that outdoor consumers have the power and potential to kind of bring about those kind of broader shifts in Mm -hmm. our relationship to consumerism, which ultimately is where addressing the fundamental questions about sustainability are going to come from. Yeah, and you look at what REI is doing. It's I think they're closed on Black Fridays, and you know Patagonia is probably the shining example on the hill. And I think the outdoor industry does a lot to give back in regarding environmental protection. You know, yes. And it seems like maybe they could turn we I should say they we should turn that that lens a little bit more towards ourselves and figure out okay, yeah, we're protecting this, and we're giving money there, and we're giving money there. How can we? look back at ourselves and figure out a way to not make as many, or if we're going to make as many of those jackets, let's figure out a way to make them, 
in a more responsible way. And that way there's right. all kinds of things going on there, but yeah, that's a, that's a thick wicket to <laughs> it is. get into, and right? <laughs> some, you know, industry folks have of course addressed this. There's the, the really well-known 2012 advertisement that Patagonia put out in um, right. the full page of the New York times that said, don't buy this jacket. Mm-hmm. I remember that one really well. Yep. And people question like, can this be in earnest? Right. In other words, like, even if a company is saying we're going to address this issue of rampant mass consumerism by suggesting that we'll make things of great enough quality that you don't need to continually buy new items, it was hard to take them seriously at the time because it was hard to believe that any company would throw itself under in yeah. that way. Well, they're seeing that um, tongue in cheek, so we'll buy more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I think people are still discussing what that kind of messaging actually does. Mm-hmm. For consumers, but I, I, I've almost never seen that come from other industries. So in that sense, again, I don't think the outdoor industry has the answers, but they are certainly pushing the envelope when it comes to asking these kinds of questions. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I meant by all the stuff that we're doing to give back in other places. We're definitely looking at it. You know, that's right. But we need to turn the lens more in, more on ourselves, I think, maybe. I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. I mean, we... Everybody wants to sell more stuff, but <laughs> I don't need another rain jacket. <laughs> I have three as it is. Well, let's shift gears and have a little bit of fun. How about if we talk about uh, what's your favorite activity or place to get outside? Sure. The very first backpacking trip that I took was as a teenager with my mom, and we mm-hmm. finally netted a reservation at the backcountry high C- in the high Sierras of in Yosemite. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. And so that was my, I, I knew in theory that I liked this kind of outdoor stuff. Mm-hmm. I knew that because my brother was a Boy Scout and I had looked mm-hmm. kind of longingly at the kinds of activities he got to participate in, but I never had access to it myself. And so the Vogel saying, Tent cabins in SMB's high country is the place that I think of when I think like this is what turned me on to a possibility of engaging with this kind of world for a lifetime. Uh There are so many other beautiful places in the world that I have been to, but that was my starting point. And so one I have a really deep attachment to. That's awesome. That's a great spot. Have you been back? I I went back a few times when I uh, still lived in California, but not since I've Uh been an adult. No. Is there a place in Colorado that you like to go? There are plenty. Yeah, I have um, enjoyed <laughs> competing with everybody else to get a campsite. <laughs> during well, the we're summer, doing that in so California I can, now. I mean, they're talking right, about yeah. reservations to get through Yosemite. Which is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so figuring that out, and and I, so yeah, I still take suggestions from all the people who've been in Colorado longer to figure out my new next favorite place. Right, there's a lot of great spots over there. What's your favorite piece of outdoor gear under a hundred dollars? I would have to say that the wool socks. And the collection that I have is probably one of the most important things that I have with me day to day. In part because, you know, any person who lives in a cold weather place knows these aren't just for outdoor activities and extreme environments. Like I wear them to work. Right, you know, I'm exactly. teaching in those socks. They're so comfortable. I would wear them at home if I'm not going out. And so in that sense, I attach kind of a really good memory to my first purchases of wool socks. This is for mm-hmm. a trip that I took kind of backpacking hut to hut around the world for a year right after college. Cool. I remember standing at A16, Adventure 16, my Southern California outdoor store, I kind of there. Saying, thinking, yeah, thinking <laughs> like, what, like, what do I need to really look the part? And like looking at this wall of socks, trying to figure out like, these are the ones that are going to work for me, but also they're going to look like I really know what I'm doing. And of course, I don't think that there is a right answer to that, but I, I do have that kind of feeling about them. That mm-hmm, wool socks mm-hmm. are one of the first ways I was like, okay, I'm really doing this. I'm serious. And so it, it made me feel good about the places I was going to. That's awesome. Yeah. No, that's important. I mean, if you get cold feet, a lot of, a lot of bad things can happen. That's right. So, yeah, and, or blisters, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to all you A16ers out there. I know there's a few of them listening. So how about some favorite books? Do you read a lot? What are some of your favorite books? <laughs> I do, both both by choice and also professionally. I was going to say, how, I just going to say, how do you find time to do that? You spend so much time <laughs> doing your own um, research. Yeah, exactly. Yes, but one fun book that I would recommend is a book called Ski Style by hmm. Annie Gilbert Coleman. It's uh, one of the books that I, it was a model and inspiration for the work that I do. And it looks at the culture and kind of world of skiing and how it evolved in the 20th century. And, and one of the reasons I love this work so much is because it, it kind of takes a recreational activity that many people know and love well and says, how did it come to be this way, right? Associated with these kinds of mm. class of people, 
this kind of economic inaccessibility sometimes in these kinds of towns with these kinds of outfits? And I love that question because it it pushes people who have you know lovingly participated in a recreational activity for a long time in a position to ask some more critical questions about, oh, how did this world that I love get to be the way that it is? Um, mm-hmm. And so that's that's one history book that deals in kind of similar worlds to the ones that we're talking about Interesting. that I think people would have a lot of fun with if they love skiing. I like that. Yeah, that's a good one. I'll check that one out. Any others? Sure. Yeah, there is another uh, newer book out um, by a historian, and I will have to go look up the title of it, but it's it's by... Phoebe Young, who's okay. a historian at University of Colorado Boulder, hmm. and it's on the history of camping or sleeping outdoors. And wow. the reason this is so fascinating to me was I picked it up because I was like, oh, great. She's going to write about people who buy tents and then go into the woods <laughs> to sleep. And she does that, but she does something far more interesting than just focusing on recreation. She looks at all the ways that sleeping outdoors have been used politically kind of to further causes in in protests and Mm, also mm -hmm. the way that sleeping outdoors in American cities in the late 20th and early 21st century have also been about kind of survival for people who are unhoused. And so looking at how similar types of products have supported not just going camping in the woods, but also kind of encampments for protests and uh, for political purposes and encampments out of necessity for people who can't um, figure out other places to live. There's a really interesting link, right? And it reminds us like, oh, that recreation is not so separate from everyday city living, right? That we're all connected right. to each other. And then what we think is an escape is really linking us back to this history of sleeping outdoors kind of in Washington, D.C., on the lawn of the, um, mall, the right. National Mall, right. right, to make claims about who should get pensions mm-hmm. after wars happen. I, and I think that's a really, again, fascinating way for people who care about the hit recreation to link their personal passions to a much broader history of the American nation and who belongs in it. Right. That's an, That sounds like an interesting book. I want to look that one up. That sounds like a good one. When you when you find the name, send it to me. I'll put it in the show notes for sure. Once we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say to or ask of our listeners? Yeah. I mean, I think, I hope that people will find kind of reflecting on the history of the stuff that they love to buy and wear interesting. And my ultimate goal in writing this history of the industry is to invite people to reflect about their own stories, right? So I'm not here to push any one narrative about here's what your hiking boots ought to mean to you, (laughs) but rather (laughs) invite people to say like, oh, like, where did I get these ideas about what I thought I needed? You know, like what have I gotten passed down from friends or family members over the generations that we've really valued? What's the stuff that I love to buy new because I want to be at the cutting edge of this particular aspect of the sport that I Mm -hmm. participate in? Mm -hmm. If people start to ask those kinds of questions and think about here are the values that, and kind of ideas and identities that I associate with what I keep acquiring or refuse to buy, on the other hand, right. then I think that we're going to do something big together when it comes to addressing kind of what does all this consumerism mean to us? And if we want something different, how do we address those questions? Love that. Yeah, because it's all about the people. That's one of the things that I started the podcast for was there's so many great people stories in the industry, you know. I love I love all the jobs that we all do and all the cool product we make and all that stuff. But I want to know about you and how you got in and why you got in and what do you do and all those things. And I think it's kind of the same lines. That's awesome. That's right. So the best thing that happens to me at, when I go and give talks about my research is that <laughs> afterwards people come up to me and say, like, well, here's the first pack I ever had. Or <laughs> I remember when I used to work at this store what it was like. And I love that because, yeah. you know, I know something as a researcher in all the stories I've collected in archives and from newspapers and publications, but that's doesn't, that's no substitute for the personal experiences that people have that they continue to share with me. And so I hope people will do that, not just with me, if we ever run into each other, but also with each other, right? Because that keeps the stories going, then it riches all of our understandings of the world that we come from. Well, I think that's the great thing about the industry. That's what makes all these trade shows and events we go to so great. I mean, not only do we have to go work and sell and do our thing, but it's like a high school reunion. Because we've all known each other for so long. And you go there and you're hugging and back slapping in the aisles and seeing old friends. And just it just makes it a great industry. It's all about the people. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And where can people find you if they'd like to follow up? 
Sure. My website is my name, rachel-gross.com. And you can also look up the book, Shopping All the Way to the Woods, How the Outdoor Industry Sold Nature to America on Amazon or anywhere else where you get your books. Cool. I was checking it out today. It's coming out March 26th, right? That's right. Yeah. Perfect. Well, it's been a great talking to you. Thanks for coming on. I look forward to meeting you one day and sharing some more stories. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Be sure to visit our website, theoutdoorbizpodcast.com, where you'll find show notes with links to everything we talked about and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or spread the word and tell a friend. That would really help us out too. Be sure to tune in every week. And thanks again for listening to the Outdoor Biz Podcast with Rick Sayes.